Welcome to the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast, hosted by author, educator, speaker, and mom, the cool cat teacher, Vicki Davis. Every weekday, Vicki and her guests will help you discover powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. In this episode, number 647, Vicki interviews Dr. Tom Murray about distance education classroom policies that are being implemented as a result of the coronavirus crisis. We want to thank Advancement Courses for sponsoring today's podcast. Stay tune at the end of the show to learn about their free micro course on online learning and how you can earn college credits for taking part in that. Let's drop into the conversation with Vicki Davis and Tom Murray right now. Today we're talking with my friend Tom Murray. He's Director of Innovation for Future Ready Schools and the, a project of the Alliance for Excellent Education. But as we do this series on how schools, particularly in the United States, are coping with the coronavirus crisis. He is a leading policy person involved in policy. He would never tell you this himself, but just this week as we're recording, uh, he's been with the U.S. Senate, the FCC, 150 state senators and mayors. He's testified before Congress. And Tom, you know, what's our state where we are today in terms of so many of us are going with distance education There's just so many schools closing and we're facing a different school situation right now. What's the big picture? Vicki, it is awesome to be with you, my friend. I love your podcast. Thanks for having me on and appreciate those kind words. Really mean it. You know, I've been just like every other educator out there burning the midnight oil, going around the clock like every other educator out there is doing right now. And the first thing I want to say is I have so much hope and renewed hope from the things that I've seen in the past couple of weeks. You know, educators have literally been asked to transform things overnight and they've done it and things aren't going to be perfect. They're never going to be perfect. And there's always room for growth. But when we ask people on a Friday to change things overnight on a Monday, completely how they do that, educators are those people that step up to the challenge. You know, I was on that call today with about 150, as you just referenced, state senators, mayors of very large cities. And one thing that gives me hope is not one time did I hear the word Republican, not one time did I hear the word Democrat. I heard an hour and a half conversation that I was blessed to be able to present at for a little while on what we can do and how we move forward and how we problem solve. And it directly correlates to what I'm seeing now in districts. You know, we have really reverted back to the fundamental and foundational aspects of what is it that kids need. And so to see superintendents working side by side with cafeteria workers and kitchen staff feeding hundreds, if not thousands of people in a given day, it gives me such hope. And and at a time like this, it is so easy to point the finger and say, well, if that person would just, or the president would just or this person would just. But what I see educators doing is pointing the finger at themselves and saying, what can I do? How can I help? And I've seen that at the level of my daughter's own fourth grade teacher on a Zoom call just to say, hey, I'm thinking about you and I miss you and I want to connect with you all the way to the highest levels of people saying, let's work together, break down some of these barriers. Now, of course, I'm going to be real. You turn on any news channel right now and within about 12 seconds, you're going to want to shut it off. I'm not going to deny that. And I'm not going to also deny that politics can be the front and center of so much negativity right now. But when we really break it down to the people and what we see from neighborhood to neighborhood and what we see educators stepping up and doing, even legislatures and mayors and those folks doing what they can do to really take this crisis and also see good in it. And I really, really believe at times like this, you've got to choose your lens wisely. If you want to watch the news and look out and see negativity all across their land, you will find it. But if you want to pause and reflect and look in your neighborhood and look to our schools and look to the things that are happening and you want to see the goodness of people, you will find it. And so my challenge for myself and for others is to choose our lens wisely and really reflect on what is it that we can do to support those of us around us, whether it's our own children, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's our teaching staff or whoever it might be. As Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And there are a lot out there, but we've also got a lot of challenges. What are the things that you and the policymakers that you advise are wrestling with right now, besides the obvious health issues? Yeah, so I'll take one of those quick examples. One of the things we've worked on actually for a long time around future ready schools is this idea of equity and access. A couple of years ago, the Pew Research Center did one of the largest studies on how many families in our country don't have internet access at home. Overnight, it has amplified an access issue in our country. And, you know, we've been yelling it from the mountaintops for a long time on students that don't have access. And so that Pew Research 
research report that I started to talk about estimated about 5 million of our nation's families didn't have broadband access at home. Disproportionately, it was our black and Hispanic families. And so, you know, from Future Ready Schools, equity's always been that really core to that work. But if I'm in a district right now doing a lot of virtual aspects of things, but I've got students at home that can't physically do what I'm doing, we've got a problem. And I've worked with some of the wealthiest school districts in our country. And sometimes it's, well, we've only got a couple or there's probably only a few, but What if you're that one child? What if it's your child that's that one child? And so one thing we've got to be really conscious of is the things that we're putting out there and the things that we're doing, does the child actually have access to do that? Now, I'm going to back that up again with saying that educators have been put in a position where it's really crisis mode, survival mode, do the best we can. And and I can't lift educators up enough because they continue to rise to the call and try and do amazing things. But we really need to be conscious of which students have access, which students don't have access. And if they don't have access, we got to be really careful not to widen the equity gaps, all in well-intended ways, but then often it's marginalized students that really miss out. And so that's just one of the areas we're working with the FCC on to allow the use of E-rate funds for home access points. I talked to a superintendent just the other day. They purchased 750 home access points to be able to give one to every single child in their district that did not have internet access at home. Um, And what we're working on federally is to really push the FCC to be able to say, hey, let's take the rules of E-rate and say they can also use it for home access points so that those districts that are trying trying to fund that currently, sustainability with those types of things, you pay monthly retainers. It's not like a one-time fee, but you're paying monthly for those kinds of things. And they can be real budget busters. And so that's just one of the areas that we're working on really to support our students and, and teachers as well. Well, and of course, the small things, which you know from your experience, is making sure that you have synchronous and asynchronous tools. So yeah, you use Zoom, but it has to be recorded and posted. And you know, the kids I have found The struggle the most are those whose families are in healthcare because the mom or the dad or both are not as home as much. And we just have to all be sensitive from both a policy level as well as a local implementation boots on the ground level. But what do you think about those school districts, Tom, that have said teachers are not permitted to contact students at all? Um, I have a psychologist that's going to be on one of these episodes who literally said one of the worst things we can do is cut off all connection between students and teachers. What do you think about those who say, oh, If everybody can't have it, nobody gets it. Yeah, so it's all over the map because you're seeing states handle this in different ways. You know, there's so many different facets to this. The union aspect being one of them, I predict far more issues arising in the the future saying, you know, our teachers don't have the preparedness for this. They don't have the professional development for this. This is outside of our teacher contract. You know, um, when I was in a district, we had created a virtual school inside of our public school, K-12, and a couple pieces maybe to help educators think through it. Number one is I will honestly say It took us three years, years to get to the point where I was really comfortable with the high quality teaching and learning. You know, one of the things that we'll see from the get go, my prediction here is we're going to see I take what I've done, I try and digitize it, I put it in a Google Classroom or I put it in a tool like that, you know, and it's read this, answer these questions, turn this in. And that's that first progression. That's that first baby step. The difficulty is there's really no teaching there. It more becomes busy worker assignments. And that's a first step, that's a first level. But at the end of the day, you're going to get very low level teaching and learning. But when we think about digital learning or or virtual learning in this regard, it's not just taking what we've always done, putting it in Google Classroom and and saying that we're there. It it is much harder to teach 30 students in a virtual class than it is being able to stand in front of them. There's times where you have to do things 30 individual times trying to work through with each student versus being able to say it in a classroom and walk up and down a row or those kinds of things. So if I were to have some recommendations for teachers right now, number one, it would be communicate really, really well. You know, it is drastic different right now for my fourth grader, Paisley, who's pretty independent and she can get her work from her teacher and she logs on and she's off and running. But I will tell you what, having a kindergartner at home, if one of us is not sitting side by side with him, it's really difficult. So the part that you were talking about, even access from a parent end is so, so true, even in our world here, but communicating well with families and communicating with students, what's expected, what's, hey, here's things you can work on if you're interested. I'd also encourage teachers to fail forward. Now is the time, just give it a try. And I 
I think we're seeing a lot of grace out there. A lot of people saying, and even on things like Facebook and social media, parent to parent saying, look, like teachers are trying, they're working hard. Let's give them all the grace in the world right now to just keep trying and encouragement. And so fail forward. Now is the time. If we can't try something now, we never will. But I will say we can't forget about privacy in this mix either. Privacy doesn't go out the window. It actually gets maximized. It's something I work with Senate and and Congress on. So yes, we can put things online. Yes, we can use different video chats. But one thing we've got to be careful of, here's one of the things that I'm seeing is the moment we hit record and students are involved in it, if we don't have parent permission, we could get ourselves into trouble. So let me give one quick resource. It's the Future of Privacy Forum, uh, fpf.org, an incredible organization I work with. Encourage you to check that out. Two other pieces that I'll say real quick, and then back over to you, Vicki. When I think about moving to some of this online, be authentic in the work, be real in the work. My daughter, I watched her get so excited the other day simply because my daughter's fourth grade teacher took her essay that she had written and just posted some notes and in some encouragement and was just really authentic and just for her. And it was just, it made her day like, I can't believe Mrs. R did this. And, and so just be authentic in that work and be real. But we also cannot forget about the social emotional learning side of things. You know, one of the things that I wrote about in my last book, Personal and Authentic, is around the hidden stories within and looking at and making sure that we amplify, especially in these cases where, where the work has been amplified, is it, we've got to care more about who we teach than what we teach. So if I'm a teacher and I'm struggling with some of this stuff, sometimes even picking up the phone, calling a house, five minute conversation with one of your students, especially your students that you struggled with prior to, or especially your students that you know may not have that support at home, simply to say, hey, I'm thinking about you and I care. Five years from now, what is it that they're going to remember? They're going to remember that authentic interaction, that personal interaction, as opposed to that additional worksheet. And I think times like this can really ignite trauma in certain students. And so we've really got to focus on the SEL pieces there. Finally, I really believe that leadership is defined in those moments where we don't know what to do. And let's just say we've got a lot of moments right now that everybody will say, I'm not sure what to do. Every one of these challenges that we're facing is an absolute opportunity to lead. And I know educators are up to that challenge, but doing whatever it takes for kids does not mean that we run over ourselves in the process. Make sure to take care of yourself in the process. So make sure to breathe, make sure to take that breath, make sure to connect with other people, ask for help when needed. And thank you for what you do every single day. Well, Tom, you've given us so much to think about and a lot of resources. And, you know, there are a lot of us out here sharing and trying to encourage. Um, there's a term that Silicon Valley uses, agile software development. And it's a very lean, mean, fast moving machine. And in many ways, that's what all of our schools are becoming. We're having to innovate. We're having to work together. And you can't press pause and wait till it's over to lead. You have to lead through it. You can't be pulled out of it. There are some things that you just have to experience and be part of. And you'll remember this the rest of your life. You'll remember what you did, how you contributed, those you reached and those you encouraged. And Tom, I'm going to be watching what you're doing. And I appreciate you and I appreciate all of the many sacrifices that you're making to be part of the solution on national level here in the United States. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much, Vicki. Advancement Courses has a free micro course, Launching Online Learning. Go to coolcatteacher.com forward slash online learning to register for this free, valuable micro course. And you can earn college credits as well. Just ask them how. Now is the time we all need to educate ourselves on effective online teaching, and Vicki recommends this course as a great and free place to start. Thank you, Advancement Courses, for sponsoring this show on such an important topic, and we'll see you next time.